Hello, art historians, and welcome to our first lecture of second semester, where we are starting off with the Italian High Renaissance. So if you are new to the class, the way that this goes is sometimes the lectures will be just context, where it kind of sets the scene for what was going on at the time. And then sometimes it will actually be looking at the pieces and the artists themselves. So what we're looking at here is just really setting the context of what was going on in history during the time and how the art pieces we're going to look at are going to reflect what is going on during the time. So when we talk about the high renaissance, that's a really important distinction because during this time, we're really looking at the high point of perfection for art in Italy during this time. So during the early renaissance we see the rebirth of those ideas of humanism that once the people in italy started really reading ancient greek and roman texts again from being exposed to those while going on the crusades because the arabic world had kind of already kept those books alive had kept interpreting them and thinking about them going on the crusades the people of europe and particularly italy because that's where most people came back from the crusades really started to notice that the Greeks were all about understanding the human and the human's place in this world and figuring out that humans were just as important as the gods and could understand this world and should strive to be godlike within this world and understand the world that they lived in. So that's really going to start with the early Italian Renaissance and the high Renaissance is the high point of that where I kind of put in the introductory slide if you look at this that it's really about beauty above all. And the, no matter what it is that they're creating, whether it's a Greco-Roman type of sculpture, whether it's a Christian type of painting, the idea is to make it look as beautiful and as perfect as possible and really master those techniques that we see developing during the early Italian Renaissance. So the idea now is humanism is kind of really really kicked up a lot where humans are starting to see themselves as god-like because art is a way for them to create like god does and if god never makes a mistake then therefore their work should also be perfect and find ways to make it look as beautiful as possible so we start to see things like artists and writers really focus on human beings and who they are and what they stand for and their place in the world and really make that an emphasis in their artwork. So humanist ideals kind of like these are some of the really big ones is that you are given these gifts as human beings of whether it be writing or art or whatever and it is your job to reach your fullest potential. That's what ancient Greek sculptures were about was a visual reminder of the perfection you should strive for. They also are very big on rationality. So everything should make sense. Um, everything should be understandable and explainable. So rationality is about balance and mathematics and measurement and having an explanation that makes sense for everything instead of it being just based on superstition. So whereas during the Middle Ages in Europe, art was really shaped by Christianity and this belief that anything too realistic or too well done can be construed as an idol worship. Now it's no, that doesn't make sense. A painting is not an idol unless an artist intends it to be. So therefore it's okay if it looks realistic and beautiful and perfect. They also started to focus more on the here and now versus the afterlife. Like art during the middle ages was really about making sure you went to the right place after death. But the focus now is a little bit more on life and enjoying this life that they actually have here. So humanism is going to be that major driver of the artwork that we're going to see during the high Renaissance and the early Renaissance. And this idea of naturalism, like how can we make it look as real as it does without any interpretation, just focusing on how does it naturally appear and trying to masterfully do that in a beautiful way. Now, one of the interesting things that we're going to see happen that's a huge shift from anything we've ever seen before is that people who were artists were actually now praised for being artists. Because prior to this time, if you were an artist, like you were a sculptor, you were a painter, you basically were at the same level, uh, level as somebody who was a carpenter or a plumber because you were just doing manual labor, like you were actually just working with your hands. 
But now that's kind of changed a little bit and we see the development of liberal arts and the idea of courses and subjects that are the humanities, like they focus on humans doing things and human talents. So we start to see for the first time liberal arts that aren't necessarily intellectual arts like math or science, but liberal arts where you have the freedom to kind of create and deviate away because science and math kind of just have rules about them, whereas art and architecture and writing, there's all different ways you can go. You're liberated, you're free to come up with these. And these kind of became known as the humanities, like history, looking at things that humans did and art and architecture and literature, because now artists were actually seen as godlike creators because they, they came up with ideas and created them and interpreted how they want to see them in their own ways. For example, the David that we see from Michelangelo will look completely different from the David that Donatello creates. So just to kind of give an idea, on the left is a work of art from the early Italian Renaissance. And on the right is a work from the high Italian Renaissance. So really kind of starting to think about what is changing and what is continuing. So obviously we can see the continuity of a religious theme here. This is a Madonna or a Mary with her child. We can see that it um, is much more human. So we can see this idea of human, you know, the way that Mary would actually look as a young woman, that she would be interacting with the baby. Um, and we can see that it's still put into a modern setting. Like they're both wearing Florentine style clothing. But the difference here is that whereas the left one is beautiful, the one on the right was using tools and specific ways to make it as pleasing to the eye as it possibly could be. So not just what is being painted, but how it's being painted can bring beauty. On the left, it's beautiful because the Madonna is beautiful. The right, it is beautiful because the goal was to make the picture itself beautiful and perfect and pleasing to the eye. So this is another example. On the left, it's not so much, I guess you could say that they're beautiful. It's a, a duke and a duchess, I guess. But the one on the right is this idea of a portrait that is beautiful, not just because the woman is beautiful, but because of the way it is painted, that we don't just see her as beautiful, but the painting as a whole is beautiful in the way that it is done. So we are going to see during the high Italian Renaissance, because remember, it does mean rebirth. So we're looking at the renewal of Greece and Rome ideas from that time, like humanism and individualism, and the art will reflect that. So if we're going back to Greco-Roman ideas, then we're going to see the revival of Greek and Roman art and architecture that reflects that. So we are going to still continue to see nudity. We're going to see um, past events in a present tense, which is something that we see frequently um, since the Middle Ages even, so that people can relate to it. Um, classical subjects, so mythology and philosophers. And we're going to see these tools of how to create these works of art to make them look as natural as possible, but much more perfected. So for example, like linear mathematical perspective, which we're going to look at. But the thing is, in the high Italian Renaissance, they really want to go beyond what the Greeks, the Greeks and the Romans did. It was, okay, that was a good start. So early Italian Renaissance, those ideas are reborn. In the high Renaissance, artists wanted to surpass that, to do more, to do make their art look even more beautiful and more realistic and more um, beautiful. You know, this world was beautiful that they lived in and humans were beautiful. So how do you make a work of art that is beautiful because it's a work of art and not just because of the subject of the work of art. Yes, it can be a beautiful woman, but it's not about that. It's how beautiful can we make this painting? How beautiful can we make this building? How can we go farther in creating a truly beautiful work of art and not just a beautiful subject, all right? So they are going to start developing and experimenting and creating kind of their own styles and their own interpretations of what beauty and perfection actually looks like. So what we're gonna see happen with the high Italian Renaissance is kind of a mirror of what we saw happen in ancient Greece. And for those of you who are joining us for second semester, this may be a little bit difficult. So I'll kind of step through this a little bit. So in ancient Greece, we had this first time period called Archaic Greece, which is Old Greece, 
where we start to see the first little twinkling of those ideas of humanism and the importance of human and rationalism and doing things that make sense. So when we're talking about that, that kind of parallels late Gothic art with artists like Giotto, who were like, you know what? It doesn't make sense that we shouldn't show a night sky within a painting because things do happen at night. Or it doesn't make sense that we shouldn't show people with their backs to the scene or engaged in the scene because that's how people actually look. So archaic Greece is kind of like that, that just first inkling of the ideas of humanism. And then we get classical Greece, which is where we kind of develop those ideas. Humanism is in full swing. The Greeks have just beat the Persians. They're kind of on top of the world. And we see that classical Greek idea of humanism really takes shape, especially if they realize that it was humans who defeated the Persians, not the gods. And they built the Parthenon, yes, for Athena, but really it honored the victory of the Greeks over the Persians. And that kind of parallels the early Italian Renaissance, that they're developing what the Renaissance is going to look like, that it's going to be about beauty and um, proportions and rationalism and what this is going to mean. And then high classical is where you really establish those rules in Greece. For example, like with the spear bearer that was kind of like, this is what this looks like. This is what perfection looks like. These are the rules. And they do that in the high classical period. They make, okay, this is the rules. This is how we do things. This is how perfection looks. And then later on, we see Hellenistic Greek because high classical art really was a, a thinking process. It was all up in the head and not so much about feeling. But Hellenistic Greeks, which we talked about in the past, is really going to kind of be revived with the Baroque, where it's about emotion and feeling and not just creating a beautiful work of art. So we can kind of see that parallel in what happened in ancient Greece and Rome, kind of paralleling what's happening in the Renaissance. Now, another important thing that's going to happen in the High Italian Renaissance is early Italian Renaissance really takes place in Florence, Italy, which is where those really wealthy families like the Medici were living and kind of paying for the Italian Renaissance. And that's because they had the money to buy these ancient Greek and Roman books and translate them. And they had the leisure time to study them. And to them, having a painting of an ancient Greek goddess or having a sculpture of a nude you know, male in their home was just a reflection of their prestige and their status because they had the luxury of education and knowledge. It was almost like an inside joke that they got that nobody else did. So Italian Renaissance art very early on is really going to be about the, it's very elitist. It's very upper class. It's very um, only to be understood and appreciated by the people who truly got it. All right. Then eventually what's going to happen is in Florence, Italy, the Medici started to fall from power a little bit. Lorenzo the Magnificent passed away. He was one of the great patrons of the arts in Florence. And Florence had started to get a name for itself as this great home of the arts and this patronage of the arts and other city states in Italy, because remember Italy actually isn't Italy yet. It's a bunch of Italian city states wanted to create art that um, and get artists and, you know, kind of pull artists away, almost like a fantasy football draft to bring them, not even a fantasy, just a draft to bring them into their city states and create art for them to kind of put them on their metaphorical refrigerator um, to show off. Another thing that happens in Florence is kind of a religious backlash to families like the Medici. And there was a monk named Savonarola and he was preaching the immorality of the Medici and the fact that their art was turning away from God and the things that they were doing with their art and the fact that there were all these wealthy families was basically spitting in God's face. And he said that if the people of Florence didn't change their minds, then there was going to be an apocalypse, like the world was going to end. So he encouraged what was called the Bonfire of the Vanities, which is a famous event in history where Bishop Savonarola excuse me, Monk Savonarola, and all of his little followers, who weirdly enough were a lot of little kids who were going like door to door in black and like scaring people and saying that if you don't give up your art, your goods, your vanities, things that you are vain about and burn them with everybody else, um, we're going to come in your home and attack you. So this, I mean, 
P paintings by Botticelli, Giotto, everything were burned and destroyed um, because of this, you know, action against the vanity of the people of Florence, especially the Medici. And eventually the Medici will run away to Rome. And the this idea of getting rid of all this vanity started to kind of filter throughout Italy. But fortunately, there's, uh, fortunately and unfortunately, the popes at this time are going to kind of pick up the idea of the Renaissance because it shows a lot of these popes that are going to be elected are from very wealthy families and they have a taste for the arts and they're not going to want to see that stop. So actually one of the popes had Savonarola burned at the stake, which is not a good thing, but you know, he tried to stop this. It's not really good. It's just kind of a picture of that. So what's going to happen is the um, Renaissance is going to move focus during the early Italian Renaissance from Florence, and it's going to make its way to Rome and a little bit in Venice, but we'll get to that later. And in Rome, Rome was the perfect place where the Renaissance should have started. They have all these Roman antiquities. They have copies of Greek sculptures. It probably should have started there in the first place, but they didn't really have the money to do that. Plus, the church would have looked kind of bad if they kick-started it first. So what we're going to start to see happen in Rome is the religious community is actually going to pick up the Renaissance almost as a way to stay relevant because during this time is the Protestant Reformation. It's starting to be rumblings against the church that there are a lot of people who are in the church who are only in it for power, who can't even read. Hey, no, sorry about that. I had to pause because one of my bosses walked in and needed to talk to me for a second. So sorry about that. But anyway. The long story short of this, completely forgetting where I left off, is the fact that now all of a sudden um, the popes of Rome are going to be coming from these very, very wealthy families who are accustomed to having this type of art and architecture in their homes, and they are educated in this regard. So with the threat of the Protestant Reformation coming, where people are starting to kind of get disgruntled with the church and the fact that there are people in the church who can't even read, kind of accepting the Renaissance and kind of starting to show that they're hip or with it with, you know, having that kind of art or architecture, even in the papal residence is going to make a huge difference for them. So we're going to stop here because one of our next lectures is going to start looking at one of the masters of the high Renaissance, and that is going to be Leonardo da Vinci.